Um, thanks, everybody. I'm going to, I'm Roger Lewis, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what an IRB does and my own interpretation of why they do it. Um, how many people have submitted something to an IRB? How many people have been surprised, frustrated, or confused by a aspect of a response that you got? Okay, so wrong. All right, these are my financial disclosures. I don't want to bring IRBs. Okay. So it is important to understand a little bit of the historical perspective that is the basis for our system of human subjects protection. Because the historical basis leads to bear some very specific meanings and terminology that it is good to be able to use correctly when communicating with people who spend their life worrying about human subject protection. So one can go back way back in the history of human of experimentation on human. But if we go back less far, um, there were lots and lots of abuses that were noted or discovered afterwards after World War II. Uh, these were not just limited to Germany um, or even to um, a particular side of the conflict. But as people started to sort out in the aftermath of World War II, the things that really bothered them about the uh, abuse of human subjects that had occurred, this led to a couple of specific um, documentation or documents that help people think about it. So the first is the Nuremberg Code which is widely cited as a key step forward in um, stating why it's important that humans be able to give free consent for participation in, in research. There's some exceptions in our current regulations, but in general. And then that free consent includes the ability to withdraw that consent at any time for any reason and without penalty. Another um, outcome of the conflict of World War II was the declaration of which helped to establish this concept that for someone to be allowed to uh, experiment on human beings, even with their consent, that there should be some independent review of the scientific basis for and the motivation for that research. You couldn't just do anything that you could convince someone to let you do to them. Someone else had to look at it and say this was actually a reasonable thing in, in uh, with respect to the expected benefit to the individual, to society, and against the risks suffered by the individuals. Now, later on, this study uh, proceeded um, uh, well into the 60s and I believe the 70s. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment was an interesting observational experiment in the sense that at the time it was initiated, uh, it was a natural history study of the course and complications of syphilis um, in African American men. And the, the human subjects issue arose when therapies started to become both identified and widely available um, that was an effective treatment for syphilis. Because the participants in the research were not informed necessarily why they were even in the study, what they were being followed for. And certainly not that there were widely available effective treatments that they weren't that was not being offered to them. And one of the cornerstones of current human subjects protection is an assurance, a guarantee that you make to the individual that if new information comes to light that would reasonably affect their decision to participate or continue to participate in that study, you are obligated to let them know about that new information. And then they, it's not explicitly stated, but even if that would result in the absolute destruction of your entire research project, because everybody would leave. And more and more we see clinical trials in these days where the clinical trial is being run and something comes out from a similar or other study that suddenly makes the, the study that you're involved in irrelevant or less interesting or maybe even the control arm is no longer the standard of, of care. We heard just on the first evening how one trial of intervention in stroke, when it read out, forced an immediate read out of another trial in stroke and ultimately the early term that study as well. The uh, underlying principles for human subjects protection were further clarified in the Belmont report that established three basic ethical principles. So the first is respect for persons. We should do things in a way that reflect the respect for the individual subject 
we are asking the person to pay the research. The second is beneficence um, versus not uh, versus non malfeasance. Every year I give this talk. Every year the night before I look up on Google exactly the difference between these two terms. Um, uh, beneficence intending to do something good that's actively beneficial versus non malfeasance trying to avoid doing something bad. It's interesting that the Belmont Report talks about the importance of beneficence, the actual prospect of benefit to the individual. Very often, depending on the risk profile of the study, what we try is just to avoid um, uh, hurting people, sort of first do no harm. And then the last principle in the Belmont Report is justice. And this is the idea that populations that have the possibility of benefiting from research should be the populations that bear the risk of participating in that research. So um, as an example, just to be starker, you shouldn't go to a poor, underserved, uneducated pocket of your community to do your research to develop a drug that will only be offered to the rich, affluent people with third party insurance, that that violates the principle of justice. So you want to experiment on the people or the representatives of the population who are likely to benefit. There are, there are some examples where we may bend this rule a little bit. We may be willing to experiment on adults to, do, to get some initial data on a drug that is actually intended for a disease that predominantly affects children. But as a general rule, children grow up to be adults, I think it's okay. okay. Um, this is borrowed without permission from the New Yorker. Um, the point here is that the cartoonist apparently thinks it's bad to be in the placebo group. I always bring this up to make the point that history has shown it's often really good to be in the placebo group. If you're in the placebo group, you have relatively lesser risks of adverse effects, okay? And people pay really close attention to you and you get access to care and follow-up. So as a general rule, this is the optimal group to be in. The point here is we don't know at the time of research whether it's better to be in one group or the other. And we want to fairly express that uncertainty to participants when they make their decision to participate. So one of the things that I'm going to do here, and for those of you who haven't heard this talk before, I think it's a little bit unusual when we talk about IRIs, is I'm going to quote parts of regulations. The reason I do this is not to make it as absolutely dry and boring as possible, but instead to drive home the fact that the reason IRBs do what they do, are structured the way they do, give you the responses they do, ask for responses to questions the way they do, is because it's required by federal law. If one reads federal law, then what they do makes sense. If you don't read the regulations, then what they do will be surprising or sometimes see the direction. Now, obviously, sometimes it is weird. Okay, but it makes a lot more sense if you understand the regulations. If I, when people ask me what is the best way to learn how to interact with the IRB, I tell them that I'm not going to say read the act, the common rule, so that you know where they're coming from. You can use the right terms with the correct definitions, and you don't use them the way clinicians make them. Okay, so um, I'm jumping ahead a teeny bit. How many of you people have heard of the term minimal risk? Okay. And I'm not going to call on you, so this is a freebie. How many of you think you know what minimal risk means um, to an IRB member? Now you can raise your hand higher. I'm not going to call on you. I don't. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's pre that's pretty good. It's incredible. In fact, there's a lot of debate over what it means and what it means in different different settings. But it has a precise regulatory definition. Very often, clinicians get into arguments about why their research should be allowed with less restrictions than the IRB may want them to have. They say, there's not much risk, there's minimal risk. Well, you know, someone undergoing a craniotomy does not meet the correct definition of minimal risk. Okay. So the first thing is understanding what does the common rule apply to? The term common rule means a set of regulations that are um, harmonized to some extent, but not completely, across multiple federal agencies. So that includes NIH. It includes FDA, it includes the Department of Defense, the Department of Education. 
they all try to take a common approach to human subjects protection and codify it slightly differently in its own rules. So this does mean, for example, if you're dealing with the FDA, you should read their version of the common rule, not the one in the United Chain of Vice Versa. So these are the sections um, um, from, I think it's 45 CFR 46. Um, section 101 says, what do these rules even apply to? Well, these rules apply to all research involving human subjects that is conducted, supported, or otherwise subject to regulation by the federal government. So in principle, if I have a little startup company out of my garage, and I want to do research on human subjects, these rules do not apply to me whatsoever. Okay? No, I'm not recommending that. Number two is if I'm doing non-federally sponsored research at my academic institution, the reason these rules apply to me is not because the rules require it, it's because the institution through which I'm doing the research has voluntarily entered into an assurance with the federal government that says because we receive federal money in general, we agree to have all of our research covered by this, even though that goes beyond what's required by law. So that's a federal assurance. Okay? So if you're in an academic institution, you're bound by these rules, let you know it's because your institution says so, not because the law says so. And if you're receiving federal money, you're absolutely bound by this. What is research? It's an activity designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. This creates all kinds of issues with, for example, QI projects or internal um, projects about the outcomes of patients. But as soon as you intend, and I would add or think you might intend, the results of your research to inform people outside of the immediate group that you're working with, that's generalizable knowledge. Um, but certainly if you have any intent to publish or use it as preliminary data and, and a grant, that would be generalizable knowledge. And a human subject is any living individual. Interestingly, dead people are not human subjects. Um, and this comes up, for example, in the setting of donor research, where the organ donor is de declared brain death. So I'm talking about a, um, uh, not a pulseless donor, but a donor with a pulse that person actually falls outside human subjects regulations. That's really confusing because most of us feel that the respect that ought to be shown to a recently deceased person is very similar to the respect that we would show for a critically ill person who's not legally dead, but the regulations don't actually say that. The Assuring compliance section of these regulations states that it is an institutional review board that's charged with assuring that there's compliance to the rest of the regulations. So that's why the IRB exists. The IRB membership is defined as at least five members with varying backgrounds to, com to promote complete and adequate review. And the varying backgrounds is interpreted to include some lay members who generally are asked to represent the values and the perspectives of the community from which research subjects will be drawn, which has really interesting implications for the use of central IRBs that we may be nowhere near or know much about your community. The IRB is, is stated that it must review research, the research protocol itself. It must review the consent form and consent procedures. So when the IRB asks you, who are you asking for how are you documenting it? What language is it in? How do you know if the person is proficient in the language in which the consent form is written? They're not just meddling in your business. They're required by law to ask you those questions. And then, right now, the IRB is also required to do continued review. So not less than annually, they are required to look at the status of your research projects and to explicitly decide whether they can be continued, with the default being that they cannot continue unless you submit the materials for continued review and they approve them. The reason I say right now is that there is a pending revision to the common rule, which is a major revision. The text of that revision has been published. If you're going to read the common rule for the first time, and you're not going to do much for about a year, read the new one. Okay? like 97 or 197 pages, I can't remember. 
um, it's good reading if you're ever trouble going to sleep. If um, if you're talking about something right now, the old version of the common rule applies. The old version of the common rule says that the IRB must do continued review. The new version says that in some cases it is it is not required. Continuing review in some ways overlaps with the kind of monitoring and ongoing research that a DSMB does, but historically continuing review has usually been much more um, non-specific and generic, like just how many patients have been enrolled, how many SAEs have there been, have there been any, any unexpected um, outcomes or results. In an attempt to match the intensity of the review to the risk profile of the study, the regulations allow for some categories of expedited review procedures. There is a term in the regulations, expedited, and there is a term, exempt. And again, I'm not going to ask, I'm just curious, how many people feel they know the difference between exempt and expedited? Well, that's pretty good, okay. Exempt means these rules don't apply at all. It is so low risk that none of these rules apply. Most institutions do not allow you to decide that your research is exempt. And the reason for that is it'd be kind of like the police saying you get to decide whether you were speeding. It's not really a good enforcement model. I like it, but it's not, it's not that good. So exempt, usually the IRB or an office in your compliance section of your organization will, will, be at, will verify that in fact something is exempt. But again, the federal government doesn't require that. The institutions do that for that protection. Expedited means that the IRB is allowed to make more efficient or simplify some of the required review procedures, such as not requiring a full meeting of the IRB, but allowing just a single member of the vice chair of the IRB to read something and allow you to get started until it's verified later by the full committee. And the things that can be expedited include minimal risk research, um, a minor change to a to a previously approved study and the continuing, approve, um, continuing review of a previously approved study. Those things can be done very quickly, don't require the whole thing. Um, here I put the regulatory definition of minimal risk. This is really important if you're involved in these discussions that you understand it so that you can seem informed when you talk to your IRB folks. It means that the probability or magnitude of harm or discomfort anticipated in the research are not greater in and of themselves than those ordinarily encountered in daily life or during the performance of routine physical or psychological examinations or tests. The interpretation of this is that it is the risk that normal people experience in normal life. Okay. So a number of folks, uh, I think well-meaning at the time, trying to argue that for a patient, for example, who suffered in medical cardiopulmonary arrest, that the risk that that patient occur, uh, um, uh, experiences in the course of usual attempts of resuscitation include all kinds of things, fracture grades from CPR, and therefore research that changed the probability of that was minimal risk research. And the uh, Office of Human Research Protections um, it was very clear that that was not what this was intended to say. This is really normal, healthy people and normal things. That's the risk that's in the risk. It's a very, very strange thing. Okay. So uh, there are apparently no pictures on the internet of an actual IRB meeting in some sort of secret club, which is a much better game picture. So what do people actually talk about? Well, what they do is they go through the set of requirements for approval in the regs, and they basically try to check off whether what you've submitted documents your compliance with the regulations. So one requirement in 46.11 is that the rules are minimized. That's the principle of beneficence. That's why there's a section that says, how are the risks minimized in the research? So if you look at my institution, and I don't know if it's true of yours, but in mine, you can basically look at each question on our IRB submission, and it reads like the section headings of the regulations. And that this is why, it's because they're required to look at each one of these things. The risks are reasonable relative to the expected benefits, um, either to the individual or to the population or the value of the knowledge to be gained. That's also beneficence. The selection of subjects is 
equitable. You're not investigating on, you know, experimenting on one group of people to help a different group. That's justice. The respect for persons is incorporated into all of the questions about the informed consent. Who's giving consent? How is the communication done? How is it documented? There is an emergency exception from informed consent, which is in the FDA regulations most explicitly, although there's a similar version buried in the preamble in the, in the HHS regulations, that says that if the research has to be, if the treatment has to be given because the patient has a sudden onset of an unpredictable condition, there's no legally authorized representative who can be contacted in the time window over which the research might, or, I'm sorry, the therapy might be effective. And if the research carries out the prospect of direct benefit to the individual, and there's some other requirements in terms of interaction with the community and public disclosure, then you can enroll patients in therapeutic studies without their individual consent. Um, this was developed in 1996 and was an explicit decision that the principle of beneficence to the population and to the individual could, under a very narrow range of circumstances, um, uh, override the general requirement of respect for persons, which is that the individual is allowed to both individually give or withdraw consent. Um, another comment about informed consent is that there are occasionally research studies in which the major risk to the individual is the loss of privacy associated with the existence of the informed consent document. So if I'm doing a survey asking about very high-risk behaviors in adolescent youth, the worst thing for that adolescent is that there's a document sitting in the scanned medical record that their parents can see that says, I asked them about how it was they smoked so much now. Okay? Um, and so the law allows for the possibility that when that is the greatest risk, that in that case there you can use only verbal consent with no word with a record. So that's related to how you document informed consent. The, the monitoring of ongoing study the, um, data, they're going to ask you how you do that in addition to supporting your continued review every year, that's beneficence. The, how you're going to maintain the privacy and confidentiality of data, that's the locked cabinet in a locked office, passwords on all the computers, basically can, uh, privacy protections as respect for persons. And the protection of vulnerable populations, no coercion. And one of the things that I think is um, particularly challenging in the setting of studies for acute um, interventions for acute disease, whether it be stroke, um, brain injury, cardiopulmonary emergencies, is the, the challenge of figuring out how you get informed consent or just inform somebody who is suddenly in a life-threatening condition or their family members just learned they're in a life-threatening condition. Um, because if someone has just told you that you or your child has a, has a life-threatening condition that's an emergency, um, there's, there's some very simple tests that show that people at that point cannot process relatively simple information that in a normal setting they have no problem. You know, can you remember three things in five minutes and answer in that setting? No, you can't. Um, and I, years ago, I did a study where, um, just to show how long ago this was, we were randomizing between Dilantin and placebo in um, young children with uh, severe closed head injury for preventing early onset post traumatic seizures. And, uh, and that was my first exper experience going up to parents of acutely injured children and trying to explain. We wanted to flip a coin to choose what your child was going to get. I didn't know which was better, and you can say no, and it's no problem, and you can withdraw consent at any time. And realizing that as soon as I said, I am Dr. Lewis, I know your child's been injured, they they heard nothing after that. Okay? There was just, there was no communication at the time. This was back in the early 90s. Um, the IRB required a written consent form. And every time I got one of those signed, God, I didn't think the drug was actually dangerous. I felt a little guilty because even though I was doing exactly what the IRB said I had to do, it had this feeling that this was not valid consent in any setting of validity. Uh, more and more, I think there's an awareness that there's a need for either short, con uh, abbreviated consent forms in these settings, or maybe even <coughs> accepting the fact that at that moment, there is no way to get valid consent. 
and we have to have provisions in place for circling back um, at a later time to explain what we're doing and why and get consent for ongoing participation. Uh, as, a, as a sole side point, consent can never be retrospective. So there was a, um, a concept called deferred consent. Anybody remember this? I think I'm going to hold up. Jeff, oh, I think you remember this. Okay. Deferred consent was dreamed up by some creative emergency physicians. <clears throat> and it was this. Wow, you're really sick. You can't possibly think clearly. I'm going to randomize you in my clinical trial. And then, if and when you wake up, and if was a very important qualifier in these studies, then I'm going to ask you for consent for what I already did. And the problem with this is you can't undo what you've done. So someone can't you give consent for something that's already happened. And the, um, I don't think it was uh, OHRP at that point, it was the, pred the predecessor office, I'm spacing out on the name for it, sent an interestingly worded memo to basically every academic physician in the US saying, <coughs> stop this immediately, we don't recognize it. You know, there are laws in jail, we might be interested in it. Okay. Um, the other thing that the IRB looks at is the requirements on the informed consent document. So the standard heading that you have in your institutional template that says things like what you're being treated for, what the alternative treatments would be, what the expected outcomes are of different treatments, who to contact if you're injured, whether payment for um, care required because of injury from research will be covered by the institution or not. All those things are just required section of the consent form, which means that you can't really decide to delete them. Um, if there are some cases in which it's particularly not applicable or misleading, um, you may be able to make an argument, but the IRB is, is usually very reticent to change those. And then the documentation of informed consent procedures. I can tell you that when, when documentation of human subjects research in my department is audited, and we have a, an auditing department that is um, meticulous, the most common thing that they come back and say they don't like is the, is the documentation of the witness or the timing of the witness or the signatures on the consent forms. Because they really care that it's clear that you can tell who the witness is, that the witness signed after the patient, because if they signed before, it's really hard to picture that they witnessed. Okay? And they really care about that process, and I, I would urge you to pay attention to it as well. Okay. Um, any questions today? Can the consent be done so we're not through with an iPad or something like that? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't, I'm not aware of anything in the regulations that, have, uh, that address the difference between paper and electronic. So certainly there's lots of consent procedures in medicine where you do sign on a little iPad and you capture it. So I'm not aware of any, uh, any difference. I don't know if anybody else is aware of any difference there. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. So the, um, the requirements for the content of the consent form are minimum requirements. There's nothing that says you can't add more in this version of the common The In my experience, the consent forms that come from for-profit pharmaceutical companies are often written by um, people with JD degrees as opposed to MD degrees, let alone elementary school teachers would might be the most appropriate people to write consent forms. Um, the average reading level of patients enrolled in human trials at my institution is between a 7th and an 8th grade reading level. Um, as a general rule, consent form in the U.S. should be written at about the 7th grade reading level. So when I get those, um, I read through them and I think, wow, I don't, you know, I know this trial, I've read the problem, I don't understand what it's saying. And there's a lot of incredibly harsh risk mitigation language from the part of you as a sponsor um, that's written in a way that, that most patients would have no idea what rights their parent is signing for. So what our IRB does is they, they mark it up 
to try to make it something so it's at least credible that half of our patients can understand it. And that removes, involves removing large paragraphs. So that's usually the dynamic I see. I don't know if it's the same here. Um, the, the new version of the common rule explicitly tries to address the complexity of consent forms because I think it's widely recognized that consent forms are no longer an effective way of communicating what we should be communicating to patients about consenting in trials. Um, which brings me to two points. One is, first of all, how many of you have, have obtained consent from the humans of their for a randomized interventional trial. Okay, so if, once you do that a few times, you start to realize there's a few key points. This is not part of your usual care. We don't know which arm is better. It's completely voluntary. It's totally fine to say no now or at any time and to make sure that they have any questions answered. So there's sort of these key, key messages that you want to get. And if you can get those core things across, You've done better than many people do in obtaining informed consent. The rest of that version is on you. So the way I talk about it is that the consent is not a form, it's a process. It's a process of communication. And if I can communicate those key elements which correspond to the, to the, the principles in the Belmont Report, and I think the person understands that, then the signature is really just showing that they that both of us were there at the same time on the same day. That's the way I look at it. Um, years ago, uh, uh, a member of my family was, was uh, undergoing a, um, a relatively routine medical procedure that involved um, uh, obtaining a, a bodily fluid. And I'm sitting there. I've been a vice chair of an IRB for about 10 years at that point. And the technician says, oh, can you sign this consent form? And I, and I look at it. This is, the needle was in the appropriate place as I was being asked to sign for a member of my family. And I look at it and it says, research consent form. And I debated the possible adverse effect on my loved one of my having thrown a hissy fit right there. Okay, so I waited until the procedure was over, and then I just said, oh, I'm calling the risk management. Because the quickest way to get a reaction from a for-profit hospital is to go up to them directly to risk management, and the hope that I right, it works very well. Okay. Um, so there's a whole bunch of abuse of consent forms and where people just throw it in. You, know, you get routine medical care, you get all this stuff to sign, assignment of benefits and stuff, a few research consents in there, who would know? Okay, children. There, uh, there's a general concept of vulnerable populations and there's pieces of the regulations that address are the societal goal of affording special protections to vulnerable populations. Vulnerable populations include people who are incarcerated, therefore have a, a loss of freedom of choice, um, pregnant women, people who are suffer um, um, mental disability or cognitive impairment, um, but children are a group that, that there's additional regulations regarding. There are sections that address categories of research for which working on um, uh, having children participate in research is okay. They are all based on the balance between the risk of the research and the benefit to the individual child or to children as a group. So 46404 talks about research that's not greater than minimal risk. It's something a kid might run into any day of their life, normal kid, normal life. That's okay even if there's no prospect of benefit to that child. 46405 says there's greater than minimal risk but there's prospect of benefit to that individual child. So think about, for example, uh, chemotherapy in a child who, who as an individual has, has a malignancy. That research is okay because the individual child may benefit. 46406, uh, research involving greater than minimal risk, no prospect of direct benefit to individual subjects, but likely to yield generalizable knowledge about sub the subjects, meaning that individual subject's disorder or condition. So think about phase one or dose finding studies in children to get the pharmacokinetics in children, but only if that child has the disease for which the agent is intended for use. 
So you can't test a new chemotherapeutic agent to get pharmacokinetics on a healthy child. Okay? You actually can in adults, it's not a great idea usually. But you can do that in adults, you cannot do that in children. 46407, research not otherwise approvable, which presents an opportunity to understand, prevent, or alleviate a serious problem affecting the health or welfare of children. So that's direct, that's benefit to the group, to the population, but the child um, uh, may not, is not expected to individually benefit. And then there are requirements for permission by parents and for assent by children. So consent is permission. If a, if a parent consents to something, they allow you to do that on behalf of their um, usually minor child. Assent is an understanding of what is intended to happen. It reflects a willingness to proceed, but it does not give you permission. As a general rule, we move towards much greater use of asset in the participation of research for children about seven years of age or older, but the, the content of the asset document has to really match the developmental level of the child, depending on the degree of risk to the child from the disease or the likelihood of benefit. So for a child, for example, who has a relatively minor condition, an asthma, for which they're making multiple vector therapies, and I'm doing an asthma trial in children, I'm going to have a pretty plain ascent form for ages seven or up. Okay, you're going to have to use a different inhaler, or you're going to have to take a pill or whatever. If I'm doing a, a study of a rescue chemotherapy for a malignancy in a child who's failed um, first and second line therapy, there may be no ascent form because the prospect of benefit to the child may be great enough that we are not actually saying the child has to assent to go on. So the, the IRB will determine the need for an ascent form, the minimum age at which you need to have an ascent form, um, and the complexity of that form. We can talk about that in a few seconds. Okay. There's a move toward the use of centralized IRBs. The new version of the common rule requires a single IRB for federally funded research, except in extraordinary circumstances. The word single is not the same as central. Central implies it's geographically somewhat centralized, so word is a famous one, but there are others. And this is a for-profit um, uh, industry. Single may mean just your IB and your institution takes responsibility for review. That means, however, that that IRB, when it's looking at a continuing review, needs to understand something about the local sensibilities of the populations across the sites in which the research is <coughs> So the goal is to leverage the repeated experience with the protocol so not, you know, 12 different committees don't have to consider the same thing and give you 12 mutually exclusive comments or suggestions. Um, the NIH has a policy already, even before the common group, on the use of the single institutional uh, review board. This is most useful for the initial approval. I'm somewhat skeptical about how well it works for ongoing um, review. Um, and the, in my opinion, the central libraries vary tremendously in quality and cost. So your institution probably has identified a subset of for-profit centralized IRBs that they're willing to work with, and if they haven't, they should. Okay? There's multiple good ones, and then there's the others. Okay, conclusions. To be successful in your interaction with your IRB, the most important thing is you learn the language, you learn the rules, and you speak respectfully and knowledgeably with your, with your uh, IRB personnel. Um, they can absolutely shut down your research career, and the aggressive clinician who claims that because they're an expert in their the disease, they are an expert in human subjects protection for research in their disease, will have a difficult research career. Um, you want to understand their, their role, their composition, the requirements, and build trust. I have found in multiple cases that if instead of arguing with my IRB or another IRB, I simply call them up and say, this is the research, this is what we're hoping to do, is there a way to make this work? They are often incredibly good at making suggestions for how to facilitate appropriate research with appropriate protections that I wouldn't have thought of. Okay? 
Um, and it's really good to get the, you know, they're, they're part of the team of research infrastructure in your institution. They're not trying to shut you down. Um, and if you see them as a, as a member, we're all sort of on the same team. Uh, I think that that goes back. Um, and do follow their policies and procedures. They are sensitive to people who try to get around. Thank you very much.